First of all, is, is everybody okay if I get rid of the mask? Okay, I've been vaccinated. This makes it a lot better. Okay, um, first of all, I want to thank the opportunity to be up here. I think you got a great museum here, and it has a lot of a uh, lot to offer. So, if, again, if you want to volunteer, please volunteer. Every effort helps. But uh, I want to go over just a little bit of what I'm going to be talking about today, and I can get prepared at the same time. Uh, Everybody know where Pinedale is? No. <laughs> Blackstone and Herndon. Blackstone and the, the north, uh, the, the northwest corner of, of there. And it was a, uh, a lumber, the lumber mill came across. Let me, I'm sorry. So that's what happened first was the lumber mill came and created the community of Pinedale with the lumber mill. Uh, second thing was, uh, that came up was, was the uh, Japanese Assembly Center where the Japanese were interned during World War II, temporarily before they got moved on to their more permanent location. Um, so there's about 25,000 25, people went through there. Um, shortly after that, the day after they closed the assembly, the assembly center, it opened up to uh, Camp Pinedale, which was uh, the Signal Corps, Army Air Corps, Signal Corps base. It was the largest in the country at the time. Uh, so I just want to give you some background. From there, after that closed in 47, uh, industry came in, and I'm sure you, you're familiar with uh, California cotton, uh, uh, let's see, ventilators, uh, and some of you remember uh, the uh, uh, Valley Decorators was another big occupant of that space up there. So uh, I just want to give you some background on that. and. Uh, I could talk for hours on any one of those subjects. So please, if I get too long, well, I need somebody, a volunteer in the background. If you can't hear me, just wiggle your ears like that or touch your ears and I'll speak up again, okay? Sometimes I get comfortable when I get down low. All right, without further ado, <clears throat> oh, but I do want to thank the organization for inviting me back. I was happy because at least nobody got mad at me the last time. So I'm, I'm glad to be back, and uh, if I can help in any way, I will. So, the Sugar Pine Lumber Mill in Pinedale was started in 1920. They started a campaign to, to start uh, the lumber mill because uh, they wanted a, a modern lumber mill to get the lumber from up in Oakers, above Oakers, Central Camp, that area up there to uh, Pinedale to, uh, to start it here. To give you a, an idea, I asked you earlier, would you know where Pinedale is? There's Pinedale, if you can see it, there's 41, Blackstone, uh, Herndon, and let me give you a little, that right there is Walmart, for your, if you don't know where it's at. Walmart there, over here is the water tower. Actually, it's over here, behind the Mexican consulate, it's right here. So give you some kind of geographical uh, lo locations if you don't know where it's at. So that's where the, the lumber mill was. It was about 573 acres. Uh, so it was very large, very large. Whoops, sorry about that. Uh, here's the early days, the gentleman that got involved in this. You got Elmer Cox, which was dealing with, uh, with the Madeira the Sugar Pine Lumber Company. He was there and he bought some rights to uh, some of the lumber up by uh, Central Camp. So he decided he's going to open up, start another lumber mill to uh, saw and mill all that lumber. So he started that. He met with Mr. Uh, Gillis, Mr. Gillis here, and uh, he, had, he was, had some money, okay? So, uh, and then you had Mr. Arthur Fleming. Well, he had big money. He made his money in real estate down in Southern California, mostly LA, Pomona, and uh, a little place called, uh, God, uh, Palaveris. You know, just a little place. Uh, so he, he made his money there, his fortune there. Uh, he also uh, started off with, uh, helped start the 
uh, Cal, Cal Poly's Pomona. He was a big uh, donor slash uh, instigator in the Pomona uh, University there. But he was a real estate guy. Yes, keep that in mind because I'll come back to that later on. And then they started a, they come up here, uh, Mr. Cox brought those two gentlemen up to the Sierras, took a long time to get up there, uh, and he showed them the, the property that he had and how much lumber was there. So he enticed them to, uh, to invest in the company. Then he got the, the Fresno County uh, Chamber of Commerce involved, and within two weeks, they put, a, put on a campaign to raise $100,000 in two weeks, which in today's dollars is about $1.3, $1.5 million in today's value in two weeks. And just remember, Fresno was not that big of a, a city. Their goal was to, uh, <clears throat> to make Fresno the third largest city in California at the time. So they wanted to bring the industry still. So much, much of the money came from Fresno and the Fresno donors. This is kind of hard to see, but this is the, uh, the layout of the, the mill itself. Let me point out some things. There's a railroad that came in. Uh, this was the main buildings there. The, the water tower is right about there. And these are all the drying areas for the lumber and stacking areas. Then we had some drying kills over here with a, uh, with a, what they called it, uh, a, uh, <clears throat> with a, a planing mill where they would plane small pieces of lumber to sell just for building houses and stuff like that. But the major lumber went out on the railroad out to uh, the rest of the country, basically. The construction of the mill, like I said, 574 acres. Uh, the construction of the building and infrastructure, you hit, we had a, a large pond that's on the left, your left. Oops, sorry about that. And uh, here's a construction of the pond. This, this was built in about 1920. This picture is from 22. This portion here was to lay the concrete foundation for the uh, railroad, which is, comes across here, to dump the logs into the pond. And the reason they did that is so it doesn't erode the, the dirt behind it and, of course, make your train uh, in, unusable. And, it, and here's the uh, overflow that kept the level of the, of the uh, pond. And here's another picture of the pond after it was developed. Here's that railroad I was telling you about. And here's the concrete that's pouring right here, right here. And the logs came up this track here and got washed off to take it into the mill to clean it up so it doesn't hurt the, st the sauce. And this is a huge building. Uh, it was probably about four stories high and it was just for milling the logs. And this is the, the, dry, the water pond, sorry, a water pond for the, um, <clears throat> for the mill to cool the, the water off because they used steam and they had their own generators there. Um, cool off the, the water, the steam to make water to reuse it. To, uh, they were actually pretty green. Um, and the sawdust that they got from the sawmill, they used to create the steam. So they were kind of bur uh, pretty, you know, green, if you want to call it that, at the time, except for the smoke that went up in the air. But it, other than that, they were pretty green. Uh, one of the things about the, the lumber mill was it was the first major lumber mill that was all electric driven in the time. Now this is, you know, you're talking the early 20s. Electricity was still new. So they brought in a bunch of generators and uh, it became the largest uh, lumber mill uh, west of the Mississippi at the time. Oh, let me point something else out here. Uh, right there, it's still standing. 
the water tower is still standing there, uh, thanks to uh, Mr. Mehmet Noyan, uh, the developer of the area now wanted to get rid of it. And he says, no, that's history. So he bought the property and it's still there. Their biggest fear was that it's going to fall down. And he said, no. It was built to handle 100 100,000 gallons of water. And there's nothing in it now. There ain't no way that it's going to fall. So he hired an engineer to prove that it's not going to fall down. It had some rust issues, minor rust issues, but they repaired that. So it's still standing. So it's still a landmark. And it's on the historical, Fresno County historical uh, resources map. Uh, it's, it's, it's there in the, in the uh, for Fresno County as being a historical site. Or it's such a historical building, if you want to call it. Here's looking northeast of, uh, of the water tower, from the water tower. Looking northeast, you can see how rugged it was over here. The river's right there. There's the bluffs. And again, there's that reference, there's that train that come across to the water pond. And uh, this is where most of the milling was done. And here's a picture of a drying, the drying kills that they used to dry the lumber. No? See, I, what I was telling you about, Pinedale's going to be the next big thing. Big, big thing. Uh, and actually, it was promoted that way, and it, it could have been that way. But it didn't happen. And this is a copy of the brochure that they had there to sell at, um, telling it not to, not to put off because property's going fast. Lots sold at early, at a easy terms. It cost $125 to buy a lot that was 25 foot wide, 125 foot long. Now most people bought at least two, so you could have an, a decent home on there. But there's still remnants of properties that are the smaller lots that are only 25 feet long. Here's the advertisement I tell you about. They're talking about next big thing. And this is mostly from my understanding is from uh, Mr. Fleming's perspective. Of course, he knew how to sell property. He knew how to promote it. So here's some things that are from the Fresno Bee. Just look at all this stuff. Uh, one of the things I like over here is no shacks in Pinedale. <laughs> and, it's, and there's another one that says no, no, no building will be, will, no building, all buildings will be painted. Now we're talking the 20s here, so it's, it's, it was kind of unique. Uh, they built the infrastructure for it and everything else, and there's just immense amount of information on here. Again, I could spend lots of time on this. Look at this. Uh, this was later on. They start, they bumped it up to $150 a lot, uh, inviting a bunch of businesses to come to Pinedale to start something new, to be entrepreneurish. And again, I love these, these advertisements, by the way. They're so, it's their art in, in themselves, you know. So again, another advertisement, Pinedale Realty was, was a subsidiary of Mr. Fleming's company. So it, there was money coming in going. He's making all kinds of money on this. So, anyway, here we go. This is the one that uh, announces that Unit 1 was all sold out. That was the close, closest to the mill. So the, bu the buildings were all sold out. Um, buy for 10 cents. Buy before next Thursday, you save 10%. You know, so it, it's a lot of stuff going on here. Some more ads. Look at the, I just love the beauty of these, these ads. All the men there looking up and working around. The, the, comp, the lumber mill was supposed to have a, a, a budget of $2 million for workers. You know, so there's money to be made. And they, had the, they published their own, uh, their own magazines. I happen to have four of them, one of them which is not up here. Uh, I've never seen any more of those uh, early on in my 
collection days, I came across them, fortunately. But I love these, again, it's more so talking about inside, talking about the people. Does it talk about the business? Yes, it talks about the business. Uh, how many board feet they've so they sold, they cut, and all that kind of information. But I like to talk about people. And in there, there's stories from all over, from up at uh, Central Camp, along the, uh, the railroad, railroads, all the little communities along the railroad. And uh, one, one of my favorite stories is when the, uh, his family announced that they had company coming all the way from Madeira to spend the night. And why did they spend the night? Because they were going to the big Fresno Fair the next day. And that was a long travel back then. Um, so, so they went, to the, they went to, the, uh, to the fair, had a good time, came back and spent the night again. So these little stories like that are in these magazines. I just love them to death because it gives you more personal feeling of how it was last night. You, you can talk about all the details, all the facts and figures, but I want to know about the people. Uh, my, oh, by the way, my grandfather was here to start this thing up, too. So he came from, from Michoacan, Mexico, and, and helped as a laborer here, and he learned a lot. Um, he was a he was an explosive uh, expert for the most of the time. Uh, so he helped uh, blow up all the tree roots, the fig roots, because it's always it was all figs at the time, and he he blew up a lot of the figs to to get the uh, stumps out. But then he started with the lumber mill. That's a long story. I'm gonna get into my personal life here. <laughs> Sorry. Here is some of the workers, great pictures of the workers. And to be totally open with you, that's my grandfather right there, Bonifacio Garcia. So uh, <clears throat> you can see kind of why I get the passion for this thing here. Okay? But these are all the mill workers here. And the reason he has an apron because he was a sorter. It was a leather apron, so you can, sometimes you get scraped by some lumber and you can get slivers. So he had the, the lumber on it, so he just moved them around. As a matter of fact, I have one of the hooks that they used to sort the lumber at, in my museum, so. Here's the, these are the mechanics here. These are all the mechanics that worked on not only the the actual mill, but also on the railroad. Here's how big it was, or they try to make it as big. This is another one of Mr. Arthur's, uh, Arthur Fleming's productions. Here is popular science, and here's a, an ad for the lumber mill. It's to sell kits to build furniture and other things. How many remember the comic books with the little thing to see, get the x-ray vision glasses? Just send your information in and stuff like that. So that's what's kind of what it was. Whoops, sorry about that. But if you, if you sent in, sent the information in, you also got one of these. It's a little slab about this big by this big. And on the front, it had some little bit of information on it. And then on the back, what do you think that is? If you cut it out right, it'll make a perfect circle and put it together. It'll make a perfect circle. So it was a challenge for the kids. You don't see that much today. You know, let them engage in, first of all, the woodworking, the cutting of it, and then put it together to make a circle. They didn't give you the answer. You had to figure it out. It took me a while to figure it out. So I have one of those too, obviously, because I have it there. But now we're getting to the Minarets and Western Railroad. This is a, another story that could, be on, could go on for hours and hours and hours ago. Here are some of the trussles that came out that supported the railroad. This is being built here, obviously, because there's no ra rails up there. Uh, there's a couple of gentlemen up there. If you see real close, there's a gentleman up there. Uh, OSHA wouldn't like this very much today. You could never get away with this today. But I just, I like this picture because it gives you an idea of how much, how much work it was to put this thing together. Uh, much like your, uh, your San Joaquin and, and Eastern Railroad, the same, same stuff. 
It was 53 miles from Friant, from the river, to, uh, to Central Camp, the railroad was. And here's the stops along the way, or the communities that went along the way. Of course, we started off at Pinedale, went 4.6 miles to Pinedale Junction. Pinedale Junction's that corner now is corner of uh, Shepherd and Willow, where it joined, where it joined with the uh, Santa Fe Railroad. So that was called Pinedale Junction. And then it went on to the Southern Pacific Railroads. And you can see those places that stopped along the way there. Sometimes it didn't stop, but those are the communities it went to. From there, we went up to the Minarets of Western Railroad, which started off at Friant, across the river, and then there's all the, the towns that it went through. And then down the bottom, then you had the Sugar Pine Lumber up at Wishon, the whiskey, the whole whiskeys, whiskers, I'm sorry, and then Central Camp. So it ended up, the last reason there's a difference between that 53 miles and that 63, the last miles there were belonged to the Sugar Pine Lumber Railroad, or the Sugar Pine Railroad. And it was a narrow gauge railroad rather than the standard gauge railroad, which minerals and western rails. And of course, you can get on, on that train up there and ride around on that railroad, which I encourage you if you haven't done it. It's quite fascinating. They put on a good dinner too, also, so. By the way, if you got any questions in, you want to, anybody want to interject, please interject. I'm not afraid of talking. If I don't know it, I'll make it up. What the heck? Here's a crossing of the San Joaquin River with a, with a load of, of lumber back in the back. And uh, of course, most, some of you know that's a Shea engine. And then here's an aerial shot of it here where it comes across here and it goes across the river and up towards uh, Wishon. Now, what's unique about the, the railroad here that was really unique for the railroad as a whole, the most powerful, powerful engine of its kind put in service. This was called the Mikado engine, but it's also known as the Minarets engine because it was specially built for the Sugar Pine the Lumber Company. The difference was it was a 10, a 2102 configuration for an engine. The best I can figure is because you got two wheels up here, you got 10 main wheels here, and you got two in the back. Anybody can confirm that? Yep. Yep. All right, I got it right. <laughs> I'm not a train expert, but it's good to know. The biggest difference was that here, if you look here, most of the engines doesn't have this piece on it. And that was a water tank. So you had all the, all the weight of the water tank on these, these, uh, these wheels. Yes, sir? No, drivers. Yeah. Oh, yeah, the drivers, okay. Give me, give me the right terminology. I, I appreciate it. And uh, so these were specially made for the, for the Minarets and Western Railroad. Uh, really, really strong. You get into the details. It weighed... Uh, 2,067 and 500 pounds, and it had 52,800 horsepower. So it was really torqued to go up these up these uh, these hills. This is another story that I, I really love. This was uh, actually it was kind of the swan song for the for the lumber mill. It was a sugar pine special, sugar pine special was uh, <clears throat> an effort by Mr. Fleming to stew up business. Business wasn't to, to happen. 1933, what happened in 1929? You know, so there's a lot of problems there. Uh, so he tried to stimulate the business. So they collected, milled, and sent out 108 railroad cars full of lumber heading towards the to Chicago 
and to be dispersed there farther on east. The lumber on the east coast was getting pretty, pretty sparse, so they were looking for this California lumber. Um, <clears throat> So I, I got a little something coming up here. Be, kind of be special for you. This is a picture of uh, of the Pinedale Special. This is Blackstone. So from here, you can see the sign there, Sugar Pine Special. Actually, it's called the Pinedale Special. It comes all the way across and through here. Back there's the water tower there. I'm just trying to give you some geographical location. Right here is, is the, uh, the meat market, okay? And, and the storage place facilities comes from here over here. So you can see how sparse it was, and all these is just fig orchards in the background. We can get that uh, from there. Oh, I live right in there, so I still live in Pinedale. So, um, so what we got here is just an example of how it looked from an airplane that was flying by, and I can prove that in just a second. I got a little special stuff for you, special something something for you. Here is a video from the day, from the time of that shipment. It was very special. The uh, <clears throat> All the schools closed down, and the kids were participated. A big band, that's, a, that's the water tower, and there's big signage on the side. If you can look carefully, each, each car has a number designated how much it goes from one to 108. And you can see the kids coming around. I wish I had somebody that could recognize some of these kids. That's Mr. Fleming there walking in the front, leading the kids in here. Look at the hairstyles, the clothes, you know. You can see who the bullies were. <laughs> and, uh, and some of the cute girls there. But they had control of them, that's good, they had control of them. And we were talking earlier about Pinedale School. They, they, these kids come from Pinedale School. And uh, some of the good-looking teachers. And then we, we had a band, big thing. We had congressmen, senators, mayors, everybody came out to celebrate this. And the whole theme of this thing was to have a, uh, you see the band, is to have a, uh, trying to scare away, I call it the bad luck or the bad juju of the times. They wanted to scare off. Some of this stuff is not politically correct, I'm warning you. Nobody get upset with me, this is just history, okay? There he is. That gentleman was known as Mr. Doom and Gloom. So they're trying to get rid of this guy. In reality, they did get rid of him, but they didn't get rid of the bad luck. <laughs> So again, this is just history, okay? I'm reporting it as it happened. You, if you do that today, you'd be in cuffs. There's more, there's more. You come in the, with a horseman. Horseman comes to finish him off. And he lights him. So this would really get you in trouble. I apologize if it offends anybody, but that's just history, okay? Tell it like it happens. Of course, the band's playing, trying to get rid of it. Look at all the people there. They're all enjoying it, hoping to chase away all the bad spirits. Now they're waving the train goodbye and good luck. Now this train went down, to south, down south, then across the, uh, the southern borders through Yuma, through a bunch of stops, and it made stops and it dropped off 
lumber at some of these stops because it was ordered especially for them. So they dropped off some of these cars at different locations across, across their path. So when they got to Chicago, it wasn't a whole 108 cars. They left them in different places. This guy's cool. Take pictures. There's Mr. Fleming there. I like this guy. I like this guy. He's so photogenic. So serious. It's Mr. Fleming flip, flipping the switch to send it on its way. And now we got the important part, the train actually moving out. Again, OSHA wouldn't like that gentleman standing up there like that. No restraints or anything else. By the way, I had a chance of getting that sign. It was in a house. When I, one thing I didn't say is I, I retired from the Marine Corps. When I retired from the Marine Corps, I would start looking for the, all this history stuff. And a gentleman come up to me and says, hey, you know that sign is at that house. So when I went to go get it, of course I rushed over to try to get it. There was nothing there. The day before, they tore it all the way down and threw everything away. So I missed it by that much. Again, see how long the engines, it took three engines to push 108 cars of lumber out. Did they make money on that trip? Uh, not much, not much. This was more of a sales pitch that we got this stuff. And uh, my personal opinion is that Mr. Fleming was great at at real estate, he wasn't too great at lumber. So he's a great promotional guy, but he didn't, he didn't have the infrastructure. He overspent in making it grand, but not to make the, the actual mill function. So he overspent basically. He actually took his daughter's trust and put it into the lumber mill. So when they went bankrupt, a lot of stuff happened. But they still made money on the, don't get me wrong, they still made money on the, uh, on the bankruptcy because his daughter took conservatorship and she sold a bunch of the stuff out. So she made some money back. So Not as much as they could have did if they would have done this right, but it was doomed from the beginning with Mr. Fleming's approach to it, the lumber mill. And that's just a personal opinion. I ain't got nothing to prove that, but I've talked to a lot of people and they said, yeah, he just, he was, he was later, soon after that, he was later uh, put in a home and his daughter took con full conservatorship of all his monies. Yeah, so, so, so he, he, was, he, wasn't, he wasn't too stable upstairs, but he was a major uh, contributor to that. So he had, he had control of the, build, of the company. That intersection right there is Blackstone right there. That's where the Marine Calendars, if you're familiar with Marine Calendars is at River Park, that's right there. So it give you a kind of perspective of where, where it's at. So the next time you drive by Marine Calendars, oh yeah, this is where it happened, you know, so. And that kind of takes care of that. Um, you got any questions for me? Uh, a lot of research. Uh, I have a, the greatest thing that I have, asset that I have in my research, is I have a lot of friends that will send me information, networking. I find something they're looking for, they send something to me that I'm looking for. So I also worked after my retirement, I worked at the library, at the main building. So I got a lot of people that love history and they research history and, and I did presentations for them. They did presentations for me and uh, made a lot of connections. So. People will constantly send me news articles. Hey, did you know this is here? Can you go get it? Um, for example, I got the uh, this little barber shop that used to be in Pinedale, right where the Ziffy Loop is, next to Blackstone and Herndon. It was called Floyd's. And this during the pan pan pandemic, I uh, I acquired 
the barber chair, the barber pole, his neon light, and all his personal tools to cut hair. So I have that. It's, it's not presented right, correctly right now in my museum, but it will. Uh, and also got a, the uh, fire alarm for the fire alarm slash sprinkler system for the Sugar Pine Lumber Company, Building 8. Building 8 was the building that Vendo was in. I got the, the fire alarm in there, which I'm reconstructing and fixing it to uh, display that one also. Yes, ma'am. Where is your museum? Oh, <laughs> I'm glad you asked. <laughs> uh, the museum is, is at, uh, the easiest say, is anybody familiar with uh, National Hardware? Yes. Okay, their entrance is on the uh, north side. I'm all the way to the south side. Where the frame, the western frame, is the same building. They were so kind to give me some space to, to, to display this picture. Yes, sir. Why did they choose to bring the logs down by railroad when the flume was so successful 20 years before? Yeah, the Madeira flume was falling apart. So they built one? And flume, Madeira, to Madeira Sugar Pine, Madeira Sugar Pine Company had their own flume. And they were shipping stuff down there. And they continued to ship down even with the railroad. Because basically they were kind of in competition with, with, the, with the Pinedale Sugar Pine Lumber Company. So, so with the railroad being what it is, and Mr. Fleming's flamboyant way, uh, and a lot of the work for the, I, where she at? I talked to the surveyors earlier, work for the, the railroad. They built that railroad in less than two years. So that whole railroad is built in less than two years, which is quite a feat. You can't even get somebody to look at the state of California to, at that time nowadays. So, so uh, they had it, and the reason they built it, a big part of it is a uh, gentleman, Mr. Fryant from Fryant, there in, he, uh, he had already done the survey. He was planning to build it, but he already had, done, had it done. Uh, Mr. Fleming bought the rights and everything else, so they got to start going right from the get-go. Hard to tell, hard to, because the demand wasn't there. So the demand wasn't there for the because nobody could afford it at the time to buy the the lumber, the products that they were selling. So that was a big, big part of that. It could have been a very successful area. Of course, as we all know, trees run out, especially the big ones. They run out. You guys living up here or being from up here can appreciate that. So they weren't so strategic as far as being. Uh, green about saving the forest and stuff. So he had acres and acres of, so they just put it down to nothing. So any other questions? Questions over here, I know. No, anybody else? I got a question. Yes, ma'am. So you mentioned, they, and I don't know that much about railroads, so then the main lines and they knew that they went to an air raid, so they had like moved the lumber from the car to switch over? Yeah, they just, they had a cranes that had just moved the, okay. the lumber across. Over. Yeah, yeah, and, and the, the crossing point for the end of the Minarets and Western Railroad um, standard rail was at the uh, at the dam at, at Crane Lake. But are you familiar with Crane Lake? It's now Bass Lake. So there was a trains that went across the dam there, and uh, so we have a lot of big connections with uh, with that area up there. So and, uh, yes, ma'am. The cars. Right. Is that sugar pine? That, that's a sugar pine. Are, are some of those engines and cars part of this? Or were they ever? Or from, Ford, from for a short, very short period of time, the, uh, the sugar pine lumber mill at Pinedale owned that. They, they were just, he was just buying up stuff up there. One of the things that I want to tell you about is the, you were asking about why they went with rail instead of the flume. They had grandioso plans. The minerals on the west side and east side of the Sierra Nevadas, 
they had planned to, mil uh, to get some of that to go through all the way across to bring all the mi uh, minerals from the other side of the deal. So that's a little, little, well, real, little known fact that they had big grandioso plans. The lumber mills to get it started and then they're looking for mining on the other side. So that was one of the plans Mr. Fleming had. It never materialized for many reasons, but uh, the depression didn't help. But uh, they were gonna mine and, and carry that ore back down to, to Fresno. Any other questions? It was San Pom uh, uh, Pomona, uh, Cal, Cal Poly Pomona, because he was a big investor of that too. That's how my grandfather got up here, because when he, he migrated up, he went through uh, to El Paso, across looking for work, got into Pomona, work, working there for a little while, and he said, hey, we're opening up this big lumber company. So he, he was by himself, he wasn't with the family yet. He came up here and started working here. Then a year later, he went back and brought the family. As a matter of fact, the house I live in is an adobe house. He helped build that, along with my father and my uncle and my mother. Um, so, so in its heyday, how many people were working in the mill? In the mill itself, they had up to, if I remember my numbers, about 2,000 people. That's a lot of people. Yes, ma'am. Oh. <laughs> okay. Uh, so it, it was a big, big to do. And uh, to make it the third largest city in Fresno, uh, to make Fresno the third largest city in, in, the, in the state was a big deal at the time. You know, because you think in Los Angeles, San Francisco, to take over, you know, Sacramento wouldn't be nothing, San Diego wouldn't be nothing. But again, it was industry, it was an agriculture, and if you know anything about Fresno County, it's kind of resists anything but agriculture, which can be good, can be bad. You never know.